it. The Sioux story that I got when I met her back in the 60s was that uh, and she talked about starting out drawing, wanting to draw, wanting to be an artist, and uh, started out with the little um, draw drawings in magazines about um, the, the draw me ones, mm -hmm. right, where they were matchbooks and in magazines and everything. So she started the, the draw me thing, um, and then she just she just really had a strong desire to become an artist, and she came across the work of Lenore Strauss. I do not remember exactly in what form that was, if it was something in a magazine or something, uh, some event that was was being advertised or what. But she decided, she saw that work and she said, this is, this is my teacher, this is my mentor, this is my master, this is who I have to learn from. And uh, she was pretty young, about 14, 15, somewhere in there. And she, uh, she found out that Lenore lived 16 miles from where she lived. And in Prince George's County, Maryland. In Prince George's County, Maryland, right. <coughs> and, and Sue's people were, uh, they, they were not wealthy people. And so she needed to get, they didn't have the car, it wasn't like they were going to take her anything. She knew she was responsible for this entire um, thing to take place that she herself was going to have to handle it every step of the way. So she went to work. She, she said she wanted a bicycle because she knew that she could ride that bicycle the 16 miles to the house where Lenore Strauss lived. So she did all this research on everything and had a solid plan. And she went to work in the local bar sweeping the floors and cleaning around until she had saved enough money to buy the bicycle. And in the meantime, she was doing all of these drawings. She was putting together a portfolio. Her body of work. There, her body yes. of work, right. And so that was what her life was about, besides the work that was required of the family uh, to keep going. So she was contributing to that also. As to Lenora Strauss's house, which was pretty intimidating because they came from a different class than what Sue and her people did. So she couldn't find the front door. And she couldn't find the front door. So it's just like all kinds of foliage and you know fences and walls and everything. And modern architecture. Right. And so did she find it? Maybe to, was it the front door that yes, she actually she arrived at? Okay. The front door. And so she rang rang the bell on the um, at the front door and with her portfolio, with her portfolio and waited there with heart pounding. And she was thinking, oh my God, what am I gonna, how am I gonna pay for this? How am I gonna pay for this? And what am I gonna say to this yeah. person when they come and to the door? Pay for it. And how am I gonna pay for it? Lenore came to the door, she opened the door, she looked at Sue and she said, how much do I owe you? And Sue was, what? And um, Sue, she said, just, she's, well, I, you know, she just started stuttering around and had her portfolio and her hands and everything. And, and Lenore looked at her and said, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were the paper boy. Because, of course, <laughs> Sue was in her. great story. Her, you know? <laughs> and, um, and Sue said, no, I'm here because I want to be an artist. And Lenore kind of sized her up, invited her into the house, sat her down, said, let me see what you've got. So Sue opened her portfolio and started uh, showing her things. And um, Lenora found her worthy of her attention. And Sue was saying, but I don't, I don't know how to pay for this. And Lenore um, asked her how she was with children. And she said, you know, fine. And Lenora said, I need um, a, a nanny, a someone to help me with, with my children so I can do my work. And uh, is there any possibility that you could move in here with me and take care of my children and I will teach you what I know. And so I thought she died and gone to heaven. Yeah. And she went, Lenore went back, took her back in the car to, to her, her home and there was, there was no father living in the home and lots of kids. And um, made an arrangement with Sue's mother to 
to let Sue go live with her. And that was... It, the famous story was just, um, how much, how am I going to pay for this? And then she says, how much do I owe you? And she, so that was, that was always the classic story. But she also worked a lot on Uncle Robert's sailboat and did a lot of sanding to also help Oh, she did. Okay. And learned to sail on the Chesapeake Bay. But she loved. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think that, how do you think that Lenore influenced Sue's artistic, philosophical, or spiritual beliefs? How did Lenore's beliefs influence Sue? Like, what do you think that she took on from Lenore, from an art philosophy? I think um, art philosophy, yes, but she also learned um, to be in that other class and learned how to speak more clearly and um, she's learned to appreciate classical music and appreciate art, so she got a, a wonderful fundamental understanding of art history and um, so Lenore was like just right there to um, to to see where Sue was, her natural instincts were coming from, too. And I think that's when she also turned around to Jan Canning as a biological illustrator um, and helped her to get that route so that she could actually get a job and support herself. And I think that supporting yourself as an artist was always a, a, a root of Sue's. It's like it was um, fundamental. You don't get a, st a straight job. You uh, do your work be, and be um, loyal to your work. And so we know that, um, I love this idea right now of just the sisters talking. It's just like a just cool sort of thinking of a hundred years in the future of just like this family conversation. Mm -hmm. So I know that both of you are artists. And I just want to say this about Sue also, okay. that was so impressive <clears throat> was her determination and that she, at a very young age, listening to the radio, she said that she could hear that the way her people, the people that were talking about the things that she was interested in spoke differently than what her people mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. And that uh, and that she was determined to change that. She wanted to learn to talk the way that uh, Lenore's class of people talked. And they, they were educated like Excuse that. Me. And um, I said, how did you proceed to do that. She said, ing. I said, what? She said, I started to put ing on the end of words, like not something, but something. And I thought it was, that was so beautiful that she, that the way Sue's mind worked was to, to, to look at the thing and recognize what it was that needed to be done <coughs> in order to make those changes. And that this kid, you know, early on, started listening to the radio and saying, I want to talk my like those people, and I, and I want to, to move on up. I'm not going to be able to. They had classical music piped into every room in the house. Oh. Yeah, and a wonderful boat. Right. Yeah. And a wooden sail. And a library yeah. with a ladder. Yeah, they were very, very, very active. So I'm going to go teach a painting step, which is perfect. Um, so I'm going to leave you two to have, answer this next question about yourselves of. Um, that you are both artists in your own right, to talk a little bit about your art, and then how do you feel like her art influenced you directly? Because um, we're talking about <clears throat> the enduring legacy, and uh, you know I could see in Lenore's work what came down to me from Sue, and so how has she influenced your art, knowing that each of you is an artist in your own right, and you can talk about that and something else that comes up, and I'll be back. You're wrong. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. I just thought about Sue. Um, every time I go to hang a little picture in the bathroom about her having a fit because the, the Strauss has actually had an original Ben Sean hanging in their bathroom. <laughs> what, just to give an instant of of what I learned from her in a, about the way that, that Sue thought about things. 
And I loved her notebooks and mm -hmm. would go through the notebooks. And I came to a drawing in, in the notebook that was, was pretty complete except for the center of the drawing, which had a, a lightly penciled in circle in it. And it said, what goes here? And the way I think is I've got to have everything figured out in advance. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like when I do paint, I'm sorry, I work on graph paper and I transfer that to the larger canvas and, you know, I've got it all worked out beforehand. Unlike the great artists like Picasso and all of that, I labor at the thing. And the fact that I could work on something and not have to have it complete in my mind first, not have to know the answers, right. and that affected me with <clears throat> everything. The way that I think, period, yeah. is like, I don't have to wait for all the answers before I can step up to the plate. And, and trust the process. And trust the process. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, she was amazing to work with. I um, you know, apprenticed with Sue for, well, many years, um, and um, and we supported ourselves in our work with Media Studios, and um, she would. Uh, she had a you know we set the the, the day by uh, first of all going out having coffee and then going out into nature, and we would take our notebooks with us, and it didn't matter what the weather was, um, but we would pick up maybe something. We would to bring home with us, or or do some field work, and just take some notes, and then um, come home to the studio, and then we would translate those notes into the clay. But it always came from nature, and I never really appreciated that about her. She said, "You know, you don't get it from a photograph." Right. You yeah. Know. So that she always worked from from the, real the, the life mm -hmm. thing the of life because it makes life. such a difference. Right. She also uh, talked about the uh, Japanese um, concept of shibu, which is this um, having life in the piece. And so it, also that part of that process of um, being taken from nature, otherwise you don't get the shibu. You know, you don't get the cheese out of it, you know? All right. Uh, the energy is not. No, the energy is not. It has to be coming right from uh, of nature, so you know. Then you, there's always that argument about does art imitate life or life <laughs> imitate, imitate art? art. So, <clears throat> um, so yeah, she, um, yeah. The nature was really, and the and the and the way that she related to to nature. I was like, yeah, I like walks and nature and all of that too, but I never really saw it until Sue came into my life and would take me on walks. And I always call it, if you go on a walk with Sue Sellers, you're gonna come back with Susie eyes and you're right. never gonna be the same. Right. She taught us to see in ways that we, mm -hmm. that we didn't see. We'd go, go for walks at four o'clock in the morning. We'd go for walks in the middle of the night. We'd go to the beach to be there in time for the sunset and and she always pointed out things like that she she knew she knew nature so well she knew where the things were hidden and she knew where the spiders because she was that biological she, illustrator yes the biological so she illustrator yeah. mm -hmm. and we'd just be you know walking along and she'd just lean over and lift a, a leaf up and say look look what's going on under here you know or look at this spider spinning her web and there were things that I would just walk by and not even see, and it was just, just a whole other appreciation. It was ecstatic, <clears throat> you know. It was just like, oh, I've never seen like this, and I've seen like that ever since. Right. And I, yeah. So I just used to tell people when she was going to take them on a nature walk, you're going to get those Susie eyes, and you're going to see everything differently from now on. And I think that applied to a lot of things about <laughs> Sue. Yeah, because she had such a an alternative view on life, even um, that uh, things that were obvious, uh, but that you never, that you just kind of took for granted, and she would just like give you a little shift, and you would see a whole new world open up. You know, 
know, you would see things differently. Um, that Aries person that she was, you know, just so unique, such an individual, so special. This is truly unique. Um, when I first met her, I thought she was an angel. She was so different and had such a presence about her, such an aura about her. Um, I was instantly fascinated with Sue and really loved her work. It was so, um, so true and um, um, so yes, so she, in, in, I said, I just want to work with you. I worked in her notebook a lot, but also wanted to do um, bring that canvas into the round and into the clay. So I so didn't do anything halfway. It was like, you didn't go buy the clay from the store. You had to go out and find the clay deposit and go dig it and then go wash it and prepare it and screen it and knead it out and work it. Um, right, and then you did all the wedgie and all that. So we would do plaster bats and I mean, just we, we didn't buy anything. We always made everything from scratch, um, including our glaze, which I still do. And she gave me that um, that standard to, um, to 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 not just get commercial products. If it was going to be yours, it was going to be yours all the way. You know, I mean, it was practically grinding your own pigments. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, and that was partly my job was to, you know, she wanted that, that Leonardo da Vinci apprentice to be with her there and help grind the pigments so that she could work. Um, so I, she asked me if, she, if I would uh, throw for her, and I learned to throw, and um, so, which I did. On the wheel. On the wheel. Mm -hmm. Sorry. And uh, so she would um, take a pot and then she would just turn it into this magical thing. And, um, and would uh, design it, and then, you know, I would help her do some of the stippling on it or, or whatever. Um, so I worked with her like that for years. And, and you actually worked in porcelain, which is really, really hard mm -hmm. to, it's a whole different, too. Now we're going to move on to the most difficult mediums in which to work, because mm -hmm. she was always off on something medium. I took classes in in uh, making jewelry so that she could incorporate that and do nice. these things. And look at these frames and things are carpentry work. And it's just, it's yeah. just anything that you could make. She's so, so influenced by science and also religion. I mean, uh, you know, we would read, we would do uh, reading Teilhard de Jardin, you know, the uh, phenomenon of man was one of our favorites. And, and then she would s draw that and sculpt it. Know? And consciousness, uh, you know, how do you raise consciousness? Um, and she was, um, I think, also influenced by Lenore uh, about politics of like, how do you um, get justice in the world? And so it was a very interesting mix of spirituality and practicality and how to get the job done and how am I going to present this so that I can break through and raise consciousness. A lot of her work was about consciousness raising. Right. Consciousness. And, um, and she was just a major force in the women's movement and um, and always um, and different, it held a different ground in our spirituality of um, that, you know, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, you know, um, that we that we are in, embodied with this spirit that um, needs to be brought forth and and, uh, and, evol and evolve. So I think all the work with the biological illustrating and evolution um, certainly um, was a, a main uh, basis of her work. She always spoke so highly of Lenore and Uncle Robert their time together and how grateful grateful she she was and eventually um, we got to meet Lenore. That's right. and, the, and also that Lenore had worked with the WPA 
I mean, Sue was impressed with that. And then, um, so she, she believed in that kind of politics too, and, you know, public art should be part of our world. And so therefore we did a lot of um, utilitarian art because we wanted it to be um, usable. It's not just something out there, it's part of the life. Every day. And so we know that Lenore came out for a visit, and there's that photo that we are all in. Right. Um, can you tell us anything about how that happened, or what what that day was like, or? Well, she came out. Um, she came. Um, well, Sue started talking to her on the phone and found out this that Lenore was in the Buddhist monastery up there in Maine, Maine. and so um, Sue had also studied. Um, meditation before, you know, before, but she uh, decided that we should all really start sitting meditation. So when Lenore came out to our little house on Railroad Avenue, uh, she asked Sue if she, if she uh, Sue asked Lenore if she would please teach us to meditate. So that's the first introduction I had to Lenore when she came out, and, um, and we went to the uh, Snow Mountain Zen Center, and we bought cushions. And we couldn't afford the, the mat, or we could buy the pillow. Um, and then she said, you know, just start simply, you know, just uh, sit for, you know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and uh, thoughts come up, and she says, just think of them as clouds that just go by. And that was all we, that was our instruction for one and she took. And so, do either of you remember meeting Lenore? Like, can you tell us anything about like what what that was like to encounter her? She had a very kind of serene presence, um, and she, and she, she was kind of awesome because she's a big woman, and um, you wanted to be very respectful around her, and you had to you really watched your words, and, <laughs> um, and yet she was. She was kind of like Eleanor Roosevelt a bit. I mean, she was also very kind of down to earth too, and, and kind, and but would really tell you what she thought. Is there anything else that you're that you notice that is um, as a standout about the relationship between Lenore and Sue in terms of just what was passed on to her in terms of art making? like style or technique or mm -hmm. philosophy about art specifically. Mm -hmm. I mean, Lenore had, in the, in the books, she, there's this real sense of um, like presence and listening to the stone and right. I bow before the stone, right? right. All of that, um, which we kind of discovered later. So when you all were working with her, we didn't know that part, right? So in your experience of you know, Lenore or Sue or their relationship, do you have any experience of that sort of art as sacred? Could you speak, speak to that? Yeah, it was, um, you know, you have to find the form within there. It was like, it's already in there, um, and you need to, like, let it loose, like, right? Free it up. Free, free, it, free up this, mm -hmm. this piece. Uh, when she did Eve, which uh, I was learning how to throw, and I was having such a hard day that day, and the, the piece started wobbling, and I just was like so frustrated. And she says, um, "Just stop and have it." And she and so she took it, and even this piece that was a mistake, you know, my mistake. She took the, um, the just the way the piece was, and saw a saw the sculpture in that piece, and so it was just marvelous to be able to watch her take this mistake and bring it into the, one of my most favorite sculptures that she's ever done. Um, and that's, so she, she honored it in that way of like, it, she always kind of went with what was, you know, always going with the flow. You know, she talked about being the adept that went down the river and missed the rocks, you know, but just always going with that flow. So um, she didn't force anything. 
you know, she she worked with the way she did, just going with that flow. And getting the message from the media itself. Yeah, right. What the media mm -hmm. that she and and every clay that we used would be a little different. You know, she said you had to really listen to the listen to it. Also, if there was a crack in the piece, she says, well, you know, if there's really a beautiful piece and it cracks in the fire, you just fill it in with gold. <laughs> yeah. she's, she's making it all work. Did she ever um, speak about the Tao of Painting book that Lenore taught her from? Yes. We had that book. And the Tao of Painting, it's just doing, you know, all those leaves, all those over and over and over, and then making, like stippling, you know, it's just a very long, tedious process. Um, but uh, love of tedium, you know, so we're talking about that love of tedium. And when I read the Tao of Painting book now, kind of like, that's where Lenore got it at a certain level, and mm -hmm. then gave it to Sue, and then eventually mm -hmm. came into what I ended up calling intentional creativity. Mm -hmm. But when I read the Tao of Painting now, I'm like, yeah. they talk about painting like it's the highest spiritual form. Right. Right. Uh, one of the things about her with which I was so impressed was her way with children. When she came into our life, um, I had a, a son and a daughter, and uh, Shannon was about eight or nine, and Brent was like just a teenager. And we always had a bunch of kids hanging out at our house that Sue was teaching all kinds of things, right. the drawing, sculpting, whatever. She was teaching them to, to um, work with a Sumi brush. It was all sitting around the around the table in front of the fireplace on the floor, working with the, the Sumi brush, and she'd have them paint with both hands. Like first you do it with this hand, and then you do it with this hand, because it creates something different in the... Well, it was working on both sides of your brain. It was working on both, both sides of your brain, and I remember the one kid, he'd just he'd do that for a little while, and then he'd just fall over backwards and start laughing. He'd say that it just, you know, it just made him high, is what he said. <laughs> so I just fall back over again. And uh, he, he went on to become a, a, is in San Francisco a really brilliant photographer. And he went to China and Michael Lewis, just Michael Lewis, and just mm -hmm. did amazing photography. And uh, as soon as Susie he, eyes. he got the Susie eyes, and as soon as he came back, he came to uh, to find me and to meet me. And he said, "You and Sue were responsible for all of this." He said, "You and Sue taught me this," and she would take the that she had a, a, the, the rover, Land Rover, mm -hmm. a little Jeep truck, I mean, actually pretty good size, actually, and she would um, get the kids up at 3 or 4 in the morning to take them out to the beach to draw at that particular hour. I mean, we mm -hmm. just don't go in the afternoon when everybody's running around in the bathing suits. We go out there to see what the creatures are doing at 4 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I remember one time that we went, and this is, Sue was famous for her getting her the things that she needed to draw. Bones and <laughs> creatures and things like that. And Filling up the freezer with roadkill. <laughs> we, we, there's still two owls in the freezer that are. <laughs> that Sue had frozen to get out so that she could draw all the details and the feathers and everything and say, where do you get these dead things? And she'd say, well, the, the live ones won't hold still. They're just like you. <laughs> and this one time that we were out early on when I first met her that we had, I don't know, kids in the back of the rover and went out to the beach really early. And we were walking along and there was a dead seal on the, on the beach there. And she looked at that, and she knew exactly what stage of deterioration it was in. And she walked over, and she hooked her fingers into, into its mouth like mm. that, and put her foot on its shoulder, and pulled that skeleton 
out of that seal wow. with with ease. I mean, it was like it was in slow motion. It was just like she just reached in, got hold of that seal, and pulled it out. Wow. And we took that home. The skeleton. Took the skeleton home. Cleaned it all up. That story. And uh, and the kids drew it. Yeah, we had all, all kinds of things like that. And just being with Sue really impacted one. I mean, if you ever met her, you would yeah. never forget her. That's good. Yeah. Pioneer heritage, so I definitely want to go back to the land and, and build. And so <clears throat> um, my daughter was um, 10, and so um, we all went up to the hills and and just and there's some that, like, and uh, borrowed money from everybody to get the down payment together. So we're making a lot of a lot of payments. We didn't look up for a long time. We we're working so hard, but um, you know, getting chickens and rats and being self-sufficient, and uh, that which was always my dream. So we did a lot of shared um, values in that, and. Uh, worked together very well for many, many years as far as uh, being self-sufficient and having an incredible garden and milking the goats. And she, um, my daughter wanted to be a veterinarian, so I said, well, we have to get the animals then. So <clears throat> we did get goats. We uh, boarded them out at a, at a friend's place when we were in Sonoma, and then when we moved to the property, we put them in the truck and took them up there and actually built the pen around them. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of a little last minute, which I think kind of crazy with Sue, but um, she, um, you know, so then Bridget was able to, to uh, learn all about the animals, and she, and it was like a real it was a pioneer kind of farm where, you know, we. And the girls, when they were little. Didn't have electricity, we just had kerosene and, and she shot, taught Shiloh and, and Bridget they said that they needed to know how to. Survive when needed, and how to. We, you were still in Sonoma when they did their first uh, cutting the head off the rooster, catching the rooster, oh, yeah. taking mm -hmm. the head off. Because we had the chickens in the backyard at the little chicken. rental that we had, and the, the two geese, Marta and Wolfgang. So that was a huge influence. And my daughter still has a goat. I think well, she finally gave it up last year, but uh, you know, 30 years of raising. Raising goats. goats. Um, so, yeah, she certainly influenced us as far as uh, politics go. Um, and we can all be <coughs> very, very active in mm -hmm. the way. Yeah, yeah. That was right in the beginning of it all, and it was right in the 70s. Pretty intense. It was. Mm -hmm. And she was like the leader. Of the the general of the army, practically, and she uh, did a lot of incredible work. Um, as so many artists do, you know, that they are political and um, take a stand, and, and um, it's life changing work. And that's what she wanted. She wanted consciousness raising. And, um, and she wanted women to really stand up for themselves. Um, I know that. Um, she always encouraged the girls to to be proud and strong and, and self sufficient, self sufficient, and um, and and to uh, not apologize for being a girl. To have confidence in themselves. Confidence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Which girls that age really need. So I think her um, uh, her timeouts. It's like uh, tea time. You know, she wanted to go have she go have take the kids and have tea with the goats. Oh yes, tea with the goats um, <laughs> and talk story and whatever. Um, and Shala still does that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's an ease about it. I would be panicked if, because you know all these mortgages were due. Um, we have to get to work, we have to get to work. Yeah. And um, Susan, you can't work like that. You have to have an 
air, an, an aura of leisure. Uh, I can't remember exactly how she said it, but it was, oh God, what was that line that she used to use? Um, but you had to like pretend that you had you were in a leisurely place when you approached your art. And you couldn't be uptight and go, oh, we've got to make money. No, no, no. She says, then you're going to be making uptight sculpture and it's not going to work. You have to have a, a, another attitude. You have to operate as though you do have the time and the money and all the necessities yeah. to be able to just be here and focus on the work. I think about the raggedy clothes that people are wearing now. They're so hip and in. I mean, you can go buy jeans that already have holes in them. And I remember when she was talking about first coming to Sausalito and everybody was supposed to be, you know, they were still style and dressing back then. And, but she had some um, gang of young people that just always had young people around her that just mm -hmm. thought that she was the hottest thing ever. And she had holes in the knees of her jeans and all of that. And I remember one of the younger people that would come and hang out with Sue that remained friends for a lifetime now. Mm -hmm. Never bring her new clothes, her new jeans, and her new pants, and her new t-shirts and sweatshirts to Sue is to break them in. And after Sue had been working in the play and painting and all of that, then Netta was, was <laughs> waiting for them. So Sue said, I always had new clothes when I wanted them because I was breaking in for <laughs> Netta. Yeah. 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 And I have to tell this story. It may be removed from this, but it's one of my favorite Sue stories, where uh, Sue, you know, when she she came to our house, she had the biggest following of guys. That mm -hmm. They always flocked to her. She wanted nothing to do with them at an emotional or sentimental level, but they all flocked after her in her little. She was fascinating. It, right. We had Charhan bringing us loads of work. It was always, you know, they were always there to, to come in. What can we do for Sue? But she had no interest in, in, in them emotionally. And Sue and I had gone to the um, Forest Knowles Lodge uh, in Forest Knowles Place. And um, we were all in the, in the bar partying, lots of people around and everything. And one of the guys that was always helping out with things came up and, and uh, Sue and I were sitting there having a beer and he says to Sue, come on Sue. Wouldn't you really like to put your arms around a real man? And she looked at him without a blink and said, I sure would, Charlie. Can you show me where I might find one? <laughs> the bar is full of these guys. And he just went, I give up. But it was, just, it was so Sue. She always had that answer right there. That, yeah. hand, that handled the situation in a graceful way yeah. and made us all laugh. But she didn't pander. No, she and she climbed up and yeah, green, oh, yeah. changed our vision about how <laughs> exactly. we looked at things. I'm very accused of, of, of pandering. And, uh, but, but that's why they loved her too. It's like yeah. um, she taught the a lot of the guys that came up to the um, to um, at the valley, at the Anderson Valley that were also back to the land uh, when they were raising chickens, but they didn't have to kill a chicken, so they would call Sue and. So we go down and show them how to kill a chick, you know? And so she, she, was, uh, she was very strong. Um, I asked Sue one time if she could tell Lenore anything after she had passed. Um, what would she want her to tell her? And she said, I would want to tell her I'm doing my work. And do you, would you speak to that for a moment of like, what do you think that work, like that's like a communication of something that Lenore would know about. What is the work? I think it's that thread that she always honored, that you didn't sidetrack from the work, that you were always doing your work. And if you weren't, you weren't, uh, it was not okay, you know? So she, she was totally dedicated to being in that flow all the time of doing the work of, Raising consciousness, letting that um, that artistic flow come through her and and out into manifested um, place. And um, you, know, you don't take a job 
you know, no, that's not it. You do the work, and and that's what you move from. No matter what. No matter that was, what. That was first, and there were times. Uh, but that was the first thing was to do the work, and the rest would come or not. Right. But she was going to be doing faithful to that. Yeah, and committed. That her mm -hmm. commitment was what just always blew my mind. Her level of commitment, no distractions, focus. I said you could visit Sue, uh, also people would come to visit, and um, Sue wouldn't stop and say, oh, come in, oh, can I, I mean, she would just continue stacking the wood pile or, or feeding the chickens or whatever. And eventually, you know, she'd get around to maybe making some tea and whatever, but it was like always in the flow of what she was doing. You know, if you wanted to visit her, you were on her terms. You know, she didn't pander. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, Sue.